The James Taylor song you hear in the background is being sung by singer, songwriter, and a legislator in the Vermont House of Representatives, who just happens to be my brother, Mike Merwicki. Hello, Mike. How are you? Great. Good to see you. Yes. How are you doing too. today? Well, we're doing uh, okay. It's a little cloudy outside, but um, yeah, it's still warm enough to play ball. A good day to play too. That's right. The sun's not out yet, but <laughs> one of my Speaking favorite. Speaking of Chicago, they yeah. had quite a pitching performance yesterday, huh? Absolutely. Um, Mr. Mills pitched uh, a no-hitter, first one in a while. And um, he's um, pretty much an up-and-coming, you know, player. Um, and everybody's calling him the second coming of, of Mr. Hendricks, who everybody now is calling um, – uh, you know, sort of, there, there's so many guys that actually were artists as pitchers. And when you talk about, um, you know, somebody that actually paints corners and, and uh, you know, throws odd pitches sometimes and uh, doesn't have a 95 mile an hour fastball, you know, it, it's somewhat, um, you know, some of the, the things they're calling him is, is baby moose. So mm -hmm. after Mike Mussino, but yeah, great performance, and um, you know it's it's a long time coming. We haven't had both Chicago teams are doing pretty well this year, aren't they? Yeah, it's it's a strange kind of situation. Imagine that being, uh, I guess it would call it the L Subway Series. Yeah, yeah, the elevated. But anyway, let's get back to. Um, talking about yourself as well as uh, you know I know pretty much your background but most people who are viewing this for the first time don't know who you are and uh, let's get to a little bit of your bio right now well sure Go, glad to share and, and 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 as you know as your brother I'm I'm up in New England and uh, not far from the what's now being called the the city of champions Boston with uh, the last 20 years, 12 different team titles from the six the Patriots had, the four the Red Sox, and then the Celtics and Bruins have each have one. So we've gotten a little spoiled, which is why it's okay that the Red Sox are having an off year right now. Um, we, we certainly don't, don't want to get spoiled about that because it took a long time for the Red Sox to be a competitive team. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad to talk baseball here with you. We're uh, working hard here in, in Vermont where I am to, to stay safe and to, to try and enjoy things as we can. And uh, as we go along, uh, it's, it's, we're certainly hopeful that uh, looking ahead, it's gonna be a much better time for, for all of us and to be able to get out more and enjoy Tell everybody about your current position. Sure. Well, I, I uh, uh, like a lot of people, have a number of jobs, and uh, one of them is uh, working in our part-time legislature here in Vermont. Um, we have a, a legislature that, like I think there's 40 states in the country that have a part-time legislature. <clears throat> and what that means, it's also called the citizen legislature, where you... We usually meet for about 16 weeks or four months a year and then go back to our regular jobs. Um, this year is different, though, and, and because of COVID, we, we stopped meeting in person in March and then took a month to, to set up the, the online process and, and we're, uh, worked until, until July, took August off, and then we're back now trying to finish the budget. So. Um, like a lot of states, we're filled with uncertainties about what what's ahead, but we're 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 hoping for a brighter future as, as we move along and continue to try and 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 settle things down with with COVID and and, and be consistent in our approach to to keeping people safe and getting the economy going again. How long you been in office? Uh, fourteen uh, fourteen years. It's uh. Seems like uh, it was just yesterday, and it's not something that I actually aspired to. 
I, I had have been working in in various public service positions, serving the public and especially human services and working with kids and families. And at, at some point, I had been doing a lot of advocacy and uh, felt like I could uh, better advocate for more kids and families at the state level and and elected public service became that next step. And uh, true to family tradition, you are still a Democrat. You bet. <laughs> you, you bet. We're in Jersey City, where we are from, the slogan was vote and vote often. <laughs> vote early, vote often. Which is, a, uh, you know, it's, it, it's interesting looking at the history because, uh, you know, one of our grandfathers, when he first came to this country, uh, went to Virginia first. West Virginia, I should say. Right. And, uh, and there was work in the coal mines there, but there was also lots of strife. And if, if you look at the, the history of the labor movement in this country, at the time, the unions were trying to organize the, the coal workers and, the, and the, the owners of the coal plants had their private armies, which, uh, which led to what was called then the Blair Mountain Massacre, uh, where there was a tent city set up for uh, for the workers and their families and the the Pinkertons or uh, their armed guards uh, just opened fire on the tent city and uh, you know there was never a clear story as to why our, our grandparents left Virgi West Virginia but some of the stories included being threatened by the KKK because they, they didn't like Catholics and and then this labor strife so that they, they did come back to to Jersey City and, uh, and that's where our Half of our connection to, to New Jersey was from. But there's a deep labor uh, and union organizing. And of course, our other grandfather was a, a union member from working in, in, in his factory. And I can't remember the name of it right now, but Worthington. Worthington Pumps. That's, That's right. right. Yep. They were actually participants in shipbuilding. That's um, right. Making ship pumps. Better. Well, and that was our connection, one of our earliest connections to baseball, because right. he was a Dodger fan. He's and a uh, Dodger fan, right? Although one of our father was actually a New York Giant fan. A giant fan, right? <laughs> so there was family strife there. What you might not have uh, remembered is that our grandfather Felix went to Jersey City and started. Um, he was involved in a bakery. That's in, right. In Hoboken. In Hoboken. And one of our cousins actually got involved in the labor movement for bakers and was actually uh, the union rep at uh, Continental Bakers, which actually was a huge bakery that made mostly white bread. <laughs> white bread, yep. Yeah. <laughs> I, remember, I, I remember family functions when... Um, our cousins would come from the bakery and big huge bags of rolls and bread would accompany them to our, our get togethers. Yep. You know, there's a, uh, somebody we grew up with in, in, in Jersey city, the Stepinski family. Right. And, uh, um, I, I actually went to school with Paula Stepinski, but her younger sister has written a book on the history of Jersey city. That's called Five Finger Discount. Wow, and, uh, <laughs> I didn't know that. I have to look that one up. It, it's, a, it's a wonderful book because it talks about the, the history of Jersey City going back to being founded as a farm community. But then it's uh, the parallel story within it is her own family history. Uh, and it's, a, it's, it's actually a very interesting. And, and you'll see a lot of pieces you remember about the, the church community that we grew up in there. Right. And her, her father, who was known as Babe. Oh, right, right, right. Well, one thing you might not have realized, and I only learned this from Jer working in Jersey City for a while, was that Jersey City was founded like Rome on the hills. Yep. And, um, you know, one of the, the they, they started going up, up the hill from when they landed, uh, you know, from the crossing on Hudson River. And the first actual city hall was a school that was sitting on top of one of the hills. 
So it got to be very interesting working, you know, in and around Jersey City for a while to learn some of the history that we hadn't. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. though, our old neighborhood was not the greatest neighborhood in the world for a while. And uh, you, you've you know, got to see some of the transformation downtown, though, too. Absolutely. In fact, it, it almost seemed like there were two cities. There was downtown and then there's the waterfront and then there's the rest of the city. And unfortunately, some of the parts of uh, Jersey City didn't get some of the renovations that uh, I, I guess really would have helped them a lot in those neighborhoods. I remember riding by the old house on 81 Brown Place, and it was still nice. The color was now white. Uh, the gardens were still there, but uh, the neighborhood wasn't a very safe one at all. Yeah. Well, anyway, let's get to baseball. Well, you know what? I'm going to backtrack a little bit, and you also have a musical career as well, too. Well, it's one of those hobbies that I think we all have. It, anybody that grew up in the in the '60s and and especially listened either to Elvis or or to the Beatles um, learned to pick up a guitar and and use that as a way to to communicate and connect with others. And it's a, it's a hobby that I still continue to enjoy, as, as do you. And I appreciate your influence over the years and uh, showing me the first the first ways to play a few chords yeah we've done the same with um, my daughter Stella who is uh, now putting out her second CD after graduating from Rowan University I remember the day and I have a picture of it that uh, she had taken piano lessons for about four years uh, two in group lesson and two in private and then decided uh, that one day she said daddy can you show me a few chords on a guitar so um, I showed her a few things and uh, she took off from there. And now she's a multi-instrumentalist, mm-hmm. plays piano, guitar, banjo, mandolin, and um, all sorts of keyboards as well too. And, and a wonderful now, writer. Yeah, she's doing pretty good with that. Uh, she has her degree now in audio technology from Yo- Rowan University. So, and how many albums have you put out yourself? Uh, I think four. Okay. Yeah. Although, you know, the, <laughs> the changes we've seen is, uh, I just read something that said vinyl outsold CDs last year. Right, right, right. Only because CDs just don't sell anymore. And the whole way people sell music is, continues to be in transition. And, and how, how musicians get paid for music continues to be. I think I heard uh, Peter Frampton uh, testified last year to Congress that uh, he has one of his more favorite, famous songs. Uh, I think it's called Do You Feel or something like that. Right, yes. Uh, in Feel one like year, that. it had like 15 million hits, and he only got about $1,000 for that. So what's happening right now is, as it was years ago, musicians are getting ripped off by big companies and it's harder and harder to make a living. So it'll be interesting to see how the music industry, except for those people at the top who continue to do well, but for the, for the bottom tiers, the minor leagues, uh, it's, it's a hard way to make a living. Yeah, and sometimes now, which is the reverse of what it used to be, is that you make more money with live performances than you do with the recorded and the yep. live performances are, are used really to promote the recorded performances. Yep. Well, so that's difficult now. What they're starting to do around here, are what they call drive-in concerts. Right. We've done those around here too. Yep. So. Uh, and in fact, yesterday I was hosting a show in Asbury Park at a place I never knew existed. It's called St. John's Island. Uh-huh. And it's in the middle of Sunset Lake in Asbury Park. Uh huh. Now, you and I have been in Asbury Park yeah. many, many times throughout our lives and never knew this thing existed. <laughs> and yeah. the entrance is off one of the crossover bridges. And it, it was amazing. They had uh, 60 people, of course, all spaced out. And um, it was a concert by Steve Forbert. Oh, nice. So it it was really nice, sold out, and um, I was um, asked to host the the show, which was really great. And they're going to do it on a weekly basis now. And actually, uh, 
my daughter Stella is going to open up for Bobby Bandiera later on in the, the month of October. Nice. Nice. So, so it's going to so be, is, is this going to be the new Mo Septi <laughs> array of, of concerts? Well, I, it's the Asbury Park Music Foundation that puts out the, uh, are sponsoring the shows and they have actually, uh, have done a lot of outdoor shows, one of which is um, Mondays in the summer at Springwood Park, which is on Springwood Avenue in Asbury Park. And it's a really nice, nice park, mostly concrete that uh, they have uh, put up with a stage, et cetera. It's basically made for live performances. And uh, they did a bunch of those during the summer as well, too. Of course, people were, you know, spaced out accordingly. And of course, everyone encouraged to wear masks. So let's get to baseball. Yeah. We grew up as Yankee fans and um, watching. Mets. Well, yes, and the Mets too, of <laughs> course. Um, but I remember watching Yankee games with uh, our dad on WPIX Channel 11. And then when the Mets came about, we were little leaguers then, and of course, they took us to baseball games, one of which was the Mets at the Polo Grounds. Yeah. First game we went, to, I've, first live game I went to. Right, right. I think that probably was the second because they, we had taken a trip to Yankees, the old Yankee Stadium once before with the Little League. But, um, and most people don't realize this, but they, the Mets back then, of course, their real name is Metropolitans. And the colors for the Mets was the blue of the old Brooklyn Dodgers yeah. and the orange of the old New York Giants. Yeah. So they uh, took into consideration the heritage that the, the Mets, and, and everybody loved the Mets when they first come, even though they couldn't play baseball too well. I remember Casey saying, can anybody play this game? <laughs> So tell, tell us more about what your thoughts are uh, of baseball these days. Well, it's interesting to, to have that, that memory of what baseball was then because, uh, you know, baseball was a throwback to, to the time when we were an agricultural country. And, and the, these stadiums in the middle of cities were, were the only places some people could go to see open green space. And uh, I think the attraction continues to be that way where uh, you get a place and Literally, since it's the only game where it doesn't have a clock, uh, although that's changing, um, you could get away and, and, and have a great escape from from the rigors of, of daily life. I think that's still the attraction of baseball, although, you know, the, the clock is coming, as they say. They're, they're using it in the minors, and I don't know if we're going to get to the point where they'll put a time limit on the end of the game, but... Um, it doesn't seem like the, this younger generation is picking up baseball the way others have. And I'm not quite sure how you, how you make that, that change without affecting the, the, the game as we know it, but uh, we'll have to see. Um, it's been an interesting season so far once, once they started. And a uh, question I have for you is I think consistently the Tampa Bay team puts a competitive team out there with one of the lowest payrolls in baseball. So how do you think they do it? Well, of course, uh, Tampa Bay has a great scouting department, as most teams do, except that, uh, you know, when you find some players and you try and lock them up, um, you know, it, it's a matter of luck sometimes. They're in first place, actually, in the American League East, uh, above uh, all the others, including the Yankees. But um, – Scouting has a lot to do with it. You find good players and you sign them and you bring them up for, through the ranks and, and hopefully, you know, your, your investment in the player pays off in the end. And uh, yes, there's been a, a good history of, of uh, talent in, in that area. Yeah, especially you know, pitchers. Yeah, exactly. Although they don't draw too well. That's the problem. No, that, and, and they don't have much money. They don't draw yeah. well. And it's, it's a shame because they're a great a competitive every year they're competitive they may, right. may not have won right but they put a competitive field team on the field and that's actually where joe madden came from he originally yep. was one of the managers of uh of tampa bay then went to the cubs and now with the angels but um 
Yeah, it's amazing to see some of the teams and, and the Orioles as well, too. You know, they're coming about with players that nobody's yep. ever heard of before. And, and uh, they're, they're although they lost two to the Yankees, but uh, they, they're, you know, a bright shining light at the end of the tunnel for, for Baltimore fans. I remember. So do you think. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Do you think this is going back to the to the Billy Bean philosophy of of using metrics instead of the, the old fashioned? No, I think it's just the opposite, actually. I think it's relying more on on scouting and scouting really is a is a gut feel. Although, you know, data comes into play on a lot of things. You know, it's yeah. only proof that you've chosen somebody that you felt, you know, deep inside that they were going to be a good ball player, which is what scouting actually is. It's, it's trying yeah. to, it's learning from people and, and myself uh, included, learning from mentors who have been around for years and years and years. And, uh, you know, them knowing what it takes to be a good ball player and what to look for. And of course, uh, as I said, Tampa Bay has a great scouting department, and they've done their job. You know, they've done it well. It's, you know, yeah. And sometimes, yeah. you know, the metrics. And I have a friend, a good friend, who's actually you know involved with Saber. Um, not every uh, piece of data is going to be usable. Sometimes, you know, you can have percentages of of where a ball is going to be hit by a certain player. But then again, all of a sudden, the, the fluke comes in. And, it, you know, instead of pulling the ball to the right side, as the percentages say he is, um, he hits one down the left field line. So sometimes uh, that is helpful, but not always exact. Yep. Well, a, a player that we saw both in Boston and New York, who you, you really couldn't position players against like that was Wade Boggs. Right, where he he literally would hit them where they where they ain't where they ain't and, exactly, uh, and uh, was was fun to watch. So it'll be interesting with this new format too, this, uh, for the playoffs. I mean, because they'll have uh, more teams, and uh, I don't know if that means that teams will more teams have a shot at it. But uh, it'll be interesting to see the. I, I don't like expanded playoffs um i i think hockey has shown that the more you expand the playoffs the 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 quality of the games goes on and i think we expect that playoff games should be of the the highest quality so we'll see how that works out but right it, it'll be interesting so your boston red sox <laughs> having a tough tough year yeah we we we, we say they've taken the year off <laughs> their, their, well, their whole starting rota rotation got hurt, and uh, and they never had a closer, so uh, there's not a lot to build on with that. So we're uh, taking the year off. And they trade their best player away. <laughs> well, that's that's another piece that I just don't understand. And uh, you know, they have the highest ticket prices of any any ballpark in the country. Wow. It's not like they don't have the money and it's not like this was a guy who was a problem. In fact, he was as good a citizen as you want, including, you know, we only found out after he'd been doing this for a while, but you know, they put the, the, the meals out for the ball players after the game and he and his brother would come in and take the leftovers and go out at night and, and give them to homeless people. Oh my goodness. And it wasn't until a reporter saw this happening and said, oh, my God, that's Mookie Betts. And they took a picture of him doing it. He never said anything to anybody. Wow. So that's the kind of guy he is. And to get rid of somebody like that who he's having a monster year right now for the Dodgers. <laughs> yes, he is. So, well, good for him. I wish him all the best. And actually, but, he's now going to start playing some games at second base. Well, that's where he started. That's what I heard. Yeah, right. Yeah. I, and he had played second base for the Red Sox, you know, a few games as yeah. well, too. I don't think anybody realized that. But he's got a rocket for an arm. So, oh. you know, I've seen. Well, I think in the first game of the year for the Dodgers, uh, he threw a guy out at third base. Right. <laughs> and from deep in right field, threw it on the fly. 
and uh, it's one of the nicest throws that, that you, you want to see. If you, I don't know if you've seen the video, but we did. Yeah, we did actually, and it's very comparable to some other people who have great arms. Of course, the, the best arm usually is in right field because yeah. he's got the longest throw. Back when we were kids, you put the worst player in right field. But uh, we actually went to a um, – when we were playing a tournament in Arizona once, we went to a game that um, was the Chicago White Sox – most White Sox players. And Michael Jordan was playing uh, yeah. that year. So anyway, Michael Jordan was really amazing as a baseball player. wasn't that good, but – he could reach first base in four steps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember him actually legging out a single on a ground ball to shortstop, and we just looked at each other and said, what the heck did we just see? But the yeah. star of the game that day was Carl Everett. Who wow. actually, yeah. actually, a ball was hit down the line, the first base line, into the corner. He reared up and threw a guy out at third base from the far corner of right field. <laughs> And we saw that the ball never went over 10 feet above the ground on a line as a strike to the third baseman. Yeah. Everybody's mouths just dropped. It's like, what did we actually see? We were all looking at each other and we're all good baseball players from, you know, playing in this tournament. And we saw them probably one of the best throws ever. Yeah. Um, in addition to that throw that Bo Jackson had made that one time in the All-Star game. But it, it's amazing that um, you don't get rid of a guy like that. You build your team around. Yeah, it's a, it's a guy who started a franchise. So I just don't understand that at all. But, you know, you're talking about arms in, in left field. You know, it's a, it's a funny field in Fenway. Right. But uh, Carl Ustremski had one of the most accurate arms and often used to lead the league in assists. And it's fun to see – his grandson now doing well for the Giants. Well, that's you always. Everybody thought that he would wind up as a Red Sox for some reason, yeah. and, and those kind of things. I think that you want to try and do to keep the heritage alive, especially you know he's such a hot ball player right now. And a chip well, maybe as a free agent he'll. But, you know, but as you know, the contract is pretty tight until you're you're in for five years, or it was right. an eight year. Right. Nadine's enjoying uh, our, our sister. Nadine is a Giants fan, and she's enjoying Mike Ostremski really, really a whole lot. Well, we're running out of time, unfortunately, and we appreciate you taking some time out of your busy day to to join us here on Round the Horn. 